Charlie, because I heard your talk on Tuesday night, and I discovered that the Lord had given me the same three points that he had given you. <laughs> and uh, I just want you to know that I did not steal your talk. He'd already given it to me before your talk. Um, but that's okay, because repetition helps us learn. Yes. And, yes. Um, but I'm going to approach this from a different angle, mostly because than, than Charlie did, because I don't know Greek. So we'll just kind of do it another way. <laughs> so I just want to start again. I know you already have this, this verse probably already memorized that we've been studying, but I just want to read it again in two different versions for us. First King James, and I'm going to just uh, read the, verse 5 and the beginning of verse 6 because that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. Amen. It's, verse 5 says in King James, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. And I want to read it in New American Standard because he uses a little bit different words. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is of God, who also made us adequate as servants of the new covenant. So, I think that these verses really address two different issues. The first is when we think too highly of ourselves, as in verse 6, Five, excuse, excuse me, verse 5. And the second is when we feel inadequate and we forget that the Lord can make us adequate. Amen. That's in verse 6. I think these verses show us two sides of a coin. Here's my coin. It's not real. <laughs> um, the, the one side of the coin, these verses talk about the times when we're being self-sufficient and we don't think we need God's help. But on the other side of the coin, it addresses the times that we feel totally insufficient for what God has called us to. And we're forgetting that we can do all things through Christ who Amen. strengthens us. Amen. We can either think we are too big or we're too small. We can have inflated, um, inflated views of ourselves or we can have deflated views of ourselves. Sometimes when we're serving the Lord, we can think we are too big for our britches, as my dad used to say, yeah. or we can feel like a worm that can do nothing for him. And sometimes what happens is we flip back and forth on both sides of the coins. In some areas of our lives or our ministry, we might be operating in self-sufficiency, while in another area of our lives or our ministry, we might be feeling totally inadequate for the struggle that we're in, and we believe that God, and we forget that God can make us adequate. So if you've ever lived on either side of this <laughs> coin or any place in between, I believe the Lord really wants to bring you encouragement today. Amen. Now, how many of you remember the Ed Sullivan Show? Yes, a lot of you are old enough like me to remember the Ed Sullivan Show. Remember when he would sometimes have a ventriloquist with a puppet on his show? Yeah. And if you haven't seen the show, just think of a ventriloquist and a puppet. Remember how when the ventriloquist will slip his hand inside of the puppet, he can do all kinds of things with that puppet. But when he removes his hand, the puppet just flops and collapses on the table. Well, one day the Lord gave me a puppet illustration, and I think it's a great way to help us remember some of these many things that we've been learning about 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6 this week. In this illustration... The Lord showed me that we are his children, as his children are the puppet. And God is like the ventriloquist. And when the Lord slips his hand inside of us, he can move our hands, he can move our lives, he can c complete his plans, his purposes. He can do anything that he wants with us. But unless we depend on God and let him slip his hand inside of us, we will be collapsed on the table. And we will not be able to do anything of significance for his kingdom. In other words, we, re we need to remember that without the Lord's help and power in and of ourselves, in our own self-sufficiency, we will be those collapsed puppets on the table. But on the flip side, on the other side of the coin, we might be a collapsed puppet on the table already, and we feel like we can't do anything but when God does slip his hand inside of us, he can do amazing things Amen. by his power within yeah. us. Yeah. And John 15, 4 through 5, it talks about how we need to abide in Christ. I'm sure we're all familiar with that passage. 
and how we cannot bear fruit by ourselves. And I think this is a similar concept to the puppet illustration. In verse 15, it shows us that if we do not abide in him, if we don't let him slip his hand into the puppet of our lives, then we will be collapsed on the table, unable to bear fruit, because apart from him, we can do nothing. But on the other side, John 15 also says that if we do abide in him, we will bear much fruit. So when we do let the Lord place his hand inside of us, as in this puppet illustration, he can do amazing things through us for his kingdom. So I I believe the message that I want to get across here today, I want to get across, the Lord wants to get across today, is that on one side of the coin, the Lord wants us to remember that we are not sufficient in and of ourselves so that we will not depend upon ourselves to minister the gospel, but instead we will rely on God's sufficiency instead of our own. And on the other side of the coin, God wants us to remember that if we feel inadequate or insufficient for what he's called us to, he is able to make us adequate through his power within us. Now, we don't have to be sufficient because God is. We just have to be obedient and follow him. We don't have to know where we're going because he does. A few years ago, the Lord called me to a new ministry, and I had no idea how to do this thing. I I just didn't have a clue. And uh, it was a ministry where I had to uh, become a nonprofit corporation. I had to have a board. I I was, here I was, the president and the CEO of a corporation, and I had to run these board meetings, and I'd never been in a board meeting in my life, and I didn't even know what you were supposed to do there. (laughs) And um, talk about feeling inadequate. I didn't just feel it. I was totally inadequate. So I cried out to the Lord for help, hoping of course, that he, he would realize he'd chosen the wrong person for this call. And, uh, but instead of letting me go, he gave me an illustration to help me walk this path that he had me on. And in this, in this he gave me a picture. He sp- speaks to me a lot in pictures. And in this picture, it was up in the mountains, and there was this hill that had just, it had just been snowed on, beautiful, pristine, st- fresh snow. No one had walked on it before. And it was that really deep snow. And in this picture, I saw Jesus walking across this hill. And as he went, his <coughs> footprints were going deep into the snow, and he was making these big holes across the snow. And so he told me, he said, this is what I want you to do, Bev. All I want you to do is just to place your foot right inside the hole that I just made for you, and you just keep walking and step your feet inside of my big footprints. And he said, but I want you to stay behind me. I don't want you to run to the left. I don't want you to run to the right. Or I don't want you to run ahead of me, and I don't want you to lag behind me, because that's what I usually do. I like to lag. I want you to just stay right behind me, and we will get you where you need to go. So our sufficient God can lead us through the snow, whatever that may be in our lives or our ministry. We don't have to know what we're doing because God does. All we have to do is follow him. And just a side note, the Lord did help me step by step and gave me the power and the ability to do that ministry, and I was able to direct it for over 13 years for, by his miraculous power. Amen. Then recently, the Lord called me to something else, and this time I also didn't have any idea what I was doing. I think the point is I don't have an, any idea what I'm doing, <laughs> and uh, so that's what just keeps happening. But this time, he gave me another picture. And this time, it was a picture of a jigsaw puzzle. And in this picture, all the puzzle pieces were scattered out on the table. And the Lord said, now all I want you to do is I want you to pick up each puzzle piece that I show you to pick up, and I want you to put it in the puzzle where I show you that it should go. And then he went on to say, there's just one problem. This puzzle that I'm giving you does not have have a lid with the picture on the box of what the puzzle looks like. So you're not going to know what this puzzle actually is supposed to look like. Have you ever tried to do a a puzzle without the picture? It's quite interesting. But he said, you don't need to know because I know what the picture looks like. You just have to pick up each piece I show you to pick up and step by step put that puzzle 
where, piece where I show you that it belongs. Has God ever called you to something that feels like the puzzle pieces are scattered all over the table and he didn't give you the picture on the box? <laughs> we don't have to know where we're going or what we're doing because he does. All we have to do is follow. He's sufficient, he can lead us, and he can empower us to do whatever he calls us to do. So, who is this sufficient God who can slip his hand into us like the illustration of the puppet? Who is this God that can use us in such powerful ways? And what can he do that we can't do on our own and our own sufficiency? So I want to take some time to share with you about who God is, his character, his nature, or his attributes, we call them. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything you probably don't already know. But I'm going to remind us, all of us, who God is, because it is really easy for us to forget, forget who God is when we're in the trenches or when we're facing many obstacles that may come our way in our lives or in our ministries. We can know who God is, but it doesn't help us a whole lot if we forget who he is when we're facing our own personal struggle. I know because I do it quite regularly. Now, even Job had to re be reminded of who God was when he was going through his trial. So the Lord spoke to him in the storm. For four chapters, the Lord went on and reminded him of who he is and what he can do. The Lord was giving Job a new perspective by reminding him that he is the all-sufficient, he is the all-sufficient God who will be sufficient for everything that Job is facing. And when the Lord was done telling him who he was, Job, Job responded in chapter 42 with, I know that you can do all things. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Now may that be true for us today. As we're reminded of who our amazing, all-sufficient God is, may we get a new perspective on the things that we're facing. May we end up saying, Lord, my eyes have seen you, and I know that you can do all things. Before I share these attributes, I want to just uh, pray for just a moment, so will you just close your eyes for just a moment? Lord, we ask you to come by your power and that you would take the words that I feel that you've given me to share about your attributes with these particular people, the particular things I felt you wanted me to share, Lord, I pray that your power would come, it would infuse each of us, Lord, and you would bring to mind in each of us whatever parts of your attributes that we need to remember today for what we are facing in our lives and in our ministries. So come, Lord, as I read what I feel you want me to share today. Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's begin. Oops. Skip the page here. There we go. God is sovereign. He is the supreme ruler who owns and reigns over all of creation with absolute freedom and authority. Psalm 47, 7 through 8 says, For the king, God is the king of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his heavenly throne. Now, at times, it may not look to us like God really is in control because he's chosen to give man free will. And yet God is still in control because he can intervene in our world and in our lives any, any time, any place, anywhere, any way he wants to, according to his nature and his will. We also know that God has authority, <coughs> all authority over Satan and all evil spirits, allowing them only limited power. So we can trust that God will help us through any spiritual battle that we may be facing. His sovereignty over, it also extends over each of our own personal lives and plans and purposes that he has for our lives. Isaiah 46, 10 through 11 says, I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. One of my favorite verses, as I grow older it, and need assurance that God is going to remain sovereign to the very end of my life, until my last breath, is Isaiah 46, 3-4, which says, Listen to me, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and carried since your birth. Even to your old age and gray hairs I am he. 
I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. Isn't that a great promise for us to remember? That was Isaiah 46, 3 to 4, if you want to jot that down. He is also the God of love. He loves you with an intensity that you will never be able to fully comprehend. But he also loves everyone else that he created, including the lost. And because of his intense love for the lost, he wants to use you and will equip you to fulfill the call that he has for you to do. We must remember that God's love is not at all like human love, for his love is deep and unfailing, unconditional and unchanging and everlasting. I love Psalm 32.10, which says, The Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. So in the midst of whatever struggle you may be having, you can know that God's unfailing love is surrounding you. And Zephaniah 3.17 even goes a little deeper and gives us a more personal picture of his love. It says, He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that an amazing thing to think of? That's the kind of deep love that he has for each of us. Now, he's also great and all-powerful or omnipotent. He is the God who split the Red Sea and opened the Jordan River. He has absolute power. He is able to do anything and everything that he wants to do, and nothing is too hard for him, and no one can withstand him. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, O sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And Jeremiah 32, 27 says, I am the Lord of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Whatever obstacle you may be facing is not too hard for our all-powerful God. He was able to create the heavens and the earth So remember that he has the power to do whatever it is in your life that seems impossible to you. Because of his mighty power, he has the power to rescue you, deliver you, protect you, and help you. Furthermore, he is able to take a portion, to impart a portion of his strength and power to you, his child, according to his will. He's able to give you his strength and his power to do his will. And when God's power flows through you, you will be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. The Lord gave David the power to kill the giant with just three small stones, and God can give us the power to have victory over the giants in our own lives. God is also the God of all knowledge, or he's omniscient. He knows everything perfectly and completely, including everything you don't know and you don't understand. 1 John 3.20 says it simply, and he knows everything. He knows everything about you. Now think about this for a minute. He knows every thought you've ever had, every word you've ever spoken, everything you've ever done. He knows every heartache you've ever had. He sees every tear you've ever shed. He knows your longings, your dreams, and your desires. He knows your pain. He knows your joy. He knows your struggles. He knows your fears. He knows your obedience. He knows your sins. He knows your love for him and everything that lies in your future. How wonderful that even though God knows you fully, he still loves us deeply in spite of our sins and imperfections. For the one who knows you the best loves you the most. He is also the God of all wisdom. He not only knows everything, but he has the wisdom to know what to do with the knowledge that he has. He knows the best thing to do with the knowledge that he has. The Lord has also gifted and called you based on his wisdom and knowledge of you. So you don't need to wonder why he gave you the gifts he did or why he's called you to these particular tasks. He has created and designed you for the gifts and callings that he's given you. He knows what you're made of, and he knows knows that with his help, you can do whatever he calls you to do. Our God of wisdom is also our mighty counselor. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel and watch over you. 
The Lord is able to give you all the knowledge and wisdom that you need for every single situation you will face in your life. Our God of all wisdom and knowledge is beside you, ready to help, guide, counsel you throughout your life and ministry. What else do you need? What else do we want? But then there's more. God is also everlasting or eternal. He has always existed and will continue to exist throughout eternity. Psalm 145.13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. He is the one who always has been and always will be. He is the eternal I am, where he is able to see eternity all at the same time. And because of this, he doesn't view things in the same way we do. That's why he says in 2 Peter 3.8, With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand, days, a thousand years is like a day. Now try to get your head around that one. I've tried. I've never gotten my head around that verse. I think he says that we can't figure it out. Sometimes it feels like the Lord is moving way too slow in the situations that we're facing. But then there's other times he moves so fast we can't keep up with him. We need to remember that he has an eternal view and he sees everything from the beginning to the end and his timing is perfect. Amen. He's also the unchanging or immutable God, his, which means his character and nature will remain the same throughout eternity and the essence of his being will never change. We all know Hebrews 13.8, uh, which says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is so encouraging to me as we live in such a crazy, changing world. Yeah. I can't even figure out my cell phone or my computer before it goes obsolete and I have to learn a whole new one. <laughs> I hate it. Um, our culture and society and our values of our world are changing at lightning speed. But God never changes and none of his attributes will ever change. Now, and that's kind of good too because it means we don't have to keep relearning this stuff. I mean, what you've learned, it's Dan. That's good. Not only that, Psalm 33:11 says, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purpose of his heart through all generations. Now that's comforting. 1 Peter 1:25 says, but the word of the Lord stands firm forever. So the truth and all the principles in the Bible will endure forever whether the world believes they're true or not. And though the world will contain, continue to change, he doesn't. And we will never have to lower our standards to meet the world's standards. We can always stand on the rock of the Lord and his word forever, no matter what change happens in our changing world. And God is faithful. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, His faithfulness continues through all generations. This means God's faithfulness to you, your life, and your ministry will never stop. One of the verses I find most helpful is 1 Thessalonians 5.24, which says, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I like this verse because it means I don't have to be sufficient in and of myself because he is the sufficient one, and he will do it. In other words, it doesn't depend on our abilities. It depends on his abilities. Amen. Because God is faithful, we can trust him. We can depend on him. We can know he, we, he will be with us and help us no matter what challenge we have. God is faithful. You can trust him to lead you through whatever lies before you. Because he's faithful, we can also trust that he will fulfill all the promises to us. Psalm 89.34 says, Nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Numbers 23.19 asks, Does he promise and not fulfill? So whatever promises God has given you, whether that was recently or many, many years ago and you're still waiting for it to happen, you can depend on our faithful God to fulfill his promises to you in his perfect timing. Yes. And God is also ever-present or omnipresent. He is present in all of space with his entire being. He is ev an ever-present spirit who fills all of space at all times with all of himself and forever. Because he's ever-present, he's always with you, near you, beside you, 
the very presence of the Almighty God surrounds you wherever you go, so you're never alone. No matter what you may be fe facing in this season of your life or what you will face in the future, he is with us to comfort us, strengthen us, help us, sustain us, protect us, and guide us. He is with you to cast out your fears and give you peace in the midst of turmoil. He is with you to give you joy in his presence as you worship and fellowship with him. He is with you every moment of every day forever. Now, when we remember that God is the, always with us, there's no longer any reason for us to fear. That's why the Lord said in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. Amen. Now I need to take a breath. That was a mouthful. <laughs> kind of like drinking from a fire hose, isn't it? Um, now I don't have time to remind you of the rest of his attributes. I haven't even covered half of them, okay? I don't have time to remind you of his transcendence, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, his perfect wrath, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his self-existence, his self-sufficiency, his goodness, his truth, his glory, his splendor, or his majesty. But this is our all-sufficient God that we're talking about. Amen. This is the one who can slip his hand into the puppet of our lives. And when he does, he can use us in amazing ways. He is the one who can enable you to do what you feel inadequate to do. After all, it's not about our ability, it's about his ability. Amen. He's also the one who wants us to depend fully on him because he can do a much better job through us than we can do on our own self-sufficiency. Now, when my son was five years old, he made a statement that I think kind of sums up the comparison between God's sufficiency and our own sufficiency. One day when he was five, he came and sat down on the kitchen table and he told me with this really confident voice, he said, God can do everything. And then he hung his head and he said, and I can't even make an ant. <laughs> we can't even make ants. And look at what he can do, okay? So that kind of puts us in our place. All right. Now, I want to talk about I want to share a true story with you. This is a story that I heard on TV, and it's about a man from Tanzania, Africa, who was running a marathon for the Olympics. And after watching it, I sensed the Lord was wanting me to, giving me some insights in regard to some spiritual applications to this story. So I want to read to you what I wrote at that, at that time, and then I'm going to share a couple things for us to reflect on. Here's the story. Years ago, there was a man from Tanzania, Africa, competing in the marathon at the Olympics. When the marathon race was over. Spectators in the stands had cleared out. The cameramen were packing up to go home, and daylight had turned to dusk. Then commotion was heard in the distance. This man from Africa was seen approaching the last stretch to the finish line. He was limping, grimacing in pain on each step. Blood ran from his leg due to the cuts from two falls he had taken during his race. A torn piece of cloth was tied around one knee. During the race, he had dislocated his knee and he had twisted his ankle. Yet he still slowly, painfully, step by step, finished the race and crossed the finish line of the marathon. When asked why he didn't quit the race because of his injuries, he replied, my country didn't send me here 5,000 miles to start this race. They sent me here to finish it. This story of this man really impressed me as I thought of how it applies to our spiritual lives. I thought of the work, the tasks, the callings, the ministries, the races that God calls each of us to do for, our, for his kingdom. He doesn't call us to just start the race. He calls us to finish it. He didn't invest his gifts in us. He didn't spend these years preparing us for his call, for us to merely start the race, but for us to finish it. Amen. Jesus said that he had finished the work that God had called him to do. 
will we finish the work that God calls us to do? When the plans, the tasks that God has for us to do, when they become difficult and painful, when they feel like the long marathon race and we're cut and we're bleeding and limping and every step we take brings pain, will we finish the race? Will we go on for the prize? When this man from Africa limped across the finish line, though there were only a few people left in the stands and milling around, great cheers broke out as they watched him cross the finish line. And when we finish our marathon, when we don't give up, but keep going against all odds and obstacles, there will be great cheers when we finish our race, but ours will be heavenly cheers, the cheers of God himself saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now I want to make some application of this. You may be a place in your life right now where you're in the starting blocks of your race, ready to begin your marathon, the call, the task that God is calling you to begin. And you might be scared to death shaking in your running shoes. This is the time to remember that God is sufficient, so it's okay if you feel inadequate. He's called you to this race, so remember 2, Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians 5.24 the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. He will be the one who will slip his hand inside of the puppet of your life and able to enable you to do what he's calling you to do. Or you may be the one who is in the first couple miles of your race, and you feel like, I got this, I can do this. But remember, you can't finish that race alone. You're not that sufficient. It's the Lord who makes you sufficient. So be sure you are holding his hand as you run. Or you may be the experienced marathon runner. Maybe you've been called by God to do things for years. Maybe you are very experienced in the call that he has given you. Maybe you've delivered more sermons than you could ever count. Maybe you've led more Bible studies than you can remember. And maybe you've led more meetings than you even wanted to go to in the first place. But when we are experienced in God's call in our lives, we face a different danger. And that is that we can de begin to depend on ourselves, upon our own experience and our own sufficiency. This is when we have the tendency to become self-sufficient instead of God-dependent. We must remember that no matter how experienced we are in doing the things of God, he is and always will be the sufficient one, not us. Now, sometimes when we're running our marathons, the enemy likes to stand on the sidelines and begin to throw things on the track in front of us to try to trip us up or to try to stop us from running this race that God has called us to. Sometimes the enemy will throw small things like empty soda cans that we can just kick out of the way as we pray and do spiritual warfare. But sometimes the enemy throws really big things on the track in front of us that feel like big refrigerators that you can't lift out of the way by ourselves. And that's the time when we need to call in the troops, when we need to call in other believers to pray with us and for us against the enemy's schemes against us. But no matter what obstacles the enemy may throw in our path of our marathon, we need to remember that our sufficient God has the power to obliterate everything the enemy tries to throw in our path. Maybe you're in the place in your life right now where you're in the last mile of your marathon of the particular task that God's called you to do. You're exhausted, you're limping, and every step you take is painful. This is when you need to remember more than ever who God is and what he can do. If you just keep holding his hand, God can pull you across the finish line if he has to. The key is always hold on to, holding on to the hand of our all-sufficient God, no matter how hard our race is. So what race are you running? What challenge has the Lord laid before you? Are you running your, your race with self-sufficiency, with God on the sidelines as you say to him, don't worry, Lord, I got this as you pass him by? <laughs> or are you on the other side of the coin where the race before you feels overwhelming, you feel untrained, unqualified for what, has God, what God has called you to get, do, you may even feel like Moses when he said, Lord, please send someone else. But remem remember, no matter what your situation, the Lord can enable you to finish your race. It's not impossible for him. He is sufficient to give you the power and the strength to cross your finish line. 
So in conclusion, Paul said in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. You can finish your race if you just keep holding the hand of our sufficient God. And when all of our marathons in life are over, when we have completed all that God wanted us to do, when we take our last breath and God closes our eyes for the very last time, then the party begins. Then the cheers of heaven will break out as we finish our cross, our finish line, no matter how battered or how bruised we may be. For there will be a day when we will all see the face of Jesus, and he will reward us for all that we have done for him, for all the marathons that we have run. And I believe that when we get just a glimpse of the face of our all-sufficient God, we will wonder why in the world we ever tried to do anything on our own and why we ever doubted his ability to use us for his kingdom.